nothing good happens when you're in places you shouldn't be. It wasn't my fault. I was sitting at a stoplight and a guy pulled up next to me. He gestured for me to roll down my window. You have a flat tire, he said. I told him thanks and pulled into the Walmart parking lot on the right. I got out and took a look. Damn. There was a screw head screwed into the tire tread and air was slowly leaking out. Great. Now what now? I decided to go to the house and buy a jar of that slime. When I got back, I pulled the screw out. Big mistake. The air started coming out with a hiss. I screwed it back in and got air at the gas station in the parking lot. I was only 15 miles from home and checked it several times. If the air started to get too low, I inserted a can of slime. There was a store about five miles from home, and in the driver's side mirror, I saw that the tire was getting quite low. I pulled into the store and there was no air. It was time to check the slime. I put it in the tire and some green slime came out. I guess they don't call it slime for nothing, but the hissing of air coming out stopped. I was about to get back in the car when I noticed a pickup truck pull up. It was one of those giant ones with huge tires. It sat so high you would need a ladder to climb in. I recognized this truck from somewhere. The door opened and a tall, blonde-haired guy stepped out. He was wearing cowboy boots and a huge belt buckle. I giggled a little, but that subsided halfway through. The passenger door opened and a beautiful woman with raven hair jumped out. I definitely recognized her. It was Rachel, the woman I'd been married to for the last 18 years. What the hell? I parked off to the side and they didn't even notice my car. It was a company car, one of those little box-shaped imports and not very noticeable, I guess. Walking into the store, they were holding hands and she was laughing in his face. I felt as if someone had punched me in the stomach. I couldn't breathe, couldn't move. All I could do was stand there like a fool. Now I remembered where I'd seen this guy before. He worked at the same company as Rachel. She was the office manager at a mental health clinic, and he was one of the customer service people. I saw the truck outside their building. The question was, what was Rachel doing with it? I couldn't remember his name. Finally, it occurred to me, Jerry Garner. The question was, why wasn't Rachel at work? I was going to find out. I went back to the car and waited. He helped her into the seat as they came out of the store, carrying cups of coffee. They sped off with a roar, and I followed at an inconspicuous distance. They pulled up to our house and he pulled into the garage. The door came down and I couldn't see anything else. I sat there for about 30 minutes, but the thought of the tire made me nervous. I kept checking it, but if it was down, I couldn't see it. Two hours later, the door opened and they drove past me. I held the file folder in front of my face, but I don't think they would have noticed. She was sitting directly across from him, and they were too busy looking at each other to notice anything else. Rachel didn't leave until 5, and now it was 2.30. I had plenty of time. First, I had to go into the house and see what I could find. At 4, I had to pick up Toby, and I had no idea what I was going to tell her. Toby was my 15-year-old daughter. I couldn't imagine what I'd find inside, but maybe I'd get some answers. When I entered the house, everything was quiet. I could hear the dripping of the faucet I was going to fix in Toby's bathroom. That was the only sound besides the whisper of air coming out of the air conditioning vents. I looked around but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I checked upstairs. The bed had been changed. There were fresh sheets. My heart dropped like a stone. I pressed my back against the wall and slid to the floor. I felt numb. There seemed to be only one rational explanation. I sat like that for probably 30 minutes. My mind was in freewheeling mode. I couldn't make sense of my thoughts and felt as if I had been drugged. My stomach rumbled and I stood up and opened a Sprite. I was hot and sweaty, so I went back to the bathroom. I fumbled for a washcloth in the toilet, soaked it in the sink and washed my face with cold water. After washing my face, I felt a little better. And then I noticed something. The floor of the shower room was wet. They had showered before going back to work. I walked back into the bedroom and sat on the edge of the bed in a daze. The bed my wife and her lover had just left. At that thought, I jumped up and looked at her in horror. This was a crime scene. I had no idea what I was going to do. Well, I was going to divorce Rachel. That went without saying. I had no idea. I didn't know any lawyers, I had no idea how to proceed, and I had to pick up Toby from school. Toby? What was I supposed to tell her? I walked out to the car feeling like I'd been drunk for ten days straight. My head was throbbing and I looked like a warmed-over death. I was in no condition to drive, but I couldn't keep Toby waiting. 
I suddenly realized that she was the only being in my life that I could truly count on. My baby was going to be okay. I had to take care of it. Whatever I did, everything had to take her opinion into account. When I stopped in the line of cars, I saw her waiting at the door of the school. She was walking down the sidewalk to her car, so beautiful it made my heart ache. Toby had her mother's hair and skin, dark, almost Mediterranean. She had the most impressive eyes I'd ever seen. They seemed dark brown like her mother's with gold and green veins. The doctor called them hazel, but I'd never seen anything like them. She was tall like me, with long honey brown legs and beauty. She opened the back door and tossed her backpack in. Once inside, she leaned in to kiss me and froze. Daddy, what's wrong? She asked. Are you sick? Did something happen? Is mommy all right? What's wrong, daddy? Her voice was rising and I could hear a note of fear in it. I had to say something. I'm fine, kitten, I said. No one got hurt or sick or anything? I need to talk to you, Toby. Let's go to the park and I'll just let me hold you and talk to you for a minute, okay? Don't ask me any more questions until we get there, okay? Okay, Daddy, but you're scaring me, she said. I know, kitten, but it's going to be okay, I told her, hoping it wasn't a lie. It only took five minutes to get to the park. I had rocked her a thousand times on those swings. Rachel and I sat on the benches and watched her play on the equipment. Happy times. Will my whole life consist of nothing but memories of happy times? We walked over to one of the benches, and she took my hand in hers, wiggling her arms, the way she had done since she was a tiny baby just learning to walk. We sat down, and I struggled to find the words to begin. Just tell me, Daddy, she said. I can handle it. Well, I'm not sure I can, I said. The story came out. I told her everything. Everything I'd seen, everything I'd felt, and the tears rolled down my cheeks like a river. She held my hand, and when the fountain of words and feelings ran dry, she clung to me. That doesn't sound good, Daddy, she said. We need to go home and ask Mom about it. I guess it all depends on what she tells us. I know it looks bad, but we don't know enough. We have to talk to her. I kissed the top of her head. My heart raced with pride. My baby girl was so much braver than I was. She tugged my hand until I stood up. Do you want to go? I asked her. Her eyes were shining. She had just gotten her driver's license. A cloud flashed in her beautiful eyes, but it passed quickly. She drove home carefully and Rachel's car was parked in the garage. That was it? She met us at the door, hugging and kissing each of us. You'd think she wasn't a cheating whore. Either she was an Oscar-winning actress, or I had misunderstood the whole situation. Would you like takeout today? She asked. My treat. I think we need to talk to you for a minute, Mom, Toby said. Okay, everything okay, baby? I don't know, Toby said. Let's find out. We walked into the house and I sat down on the couch next to Toby. Rachel remained seated on the hideous chair she just had to have. What's wrong? she asked. There wasn't an ounce of concern on her face. How was your day? I asked. She looked at me curiously. The usual, she said. One of the company representatives had brought lunch from the onion basket. It was very crowded, and I hardly had a spare minute. Why do you ask that? So you've been in the office all day? asked Toby. Of course, she said. What kind of questions are these? What's going on? So you weren't at this house this afternoon with Jerry Garner? I asked. Her face went pale. Of course not, she said. Are you accusing me of something, Oliver? I saw you, I told her. What? You didn't see anything, she stammered. What are you trying to do? He's lying, Toby. I've been in the office all day. You can ask Angel. No, I don't think he's lying, Mom, Toby said. I think you're lying. I'm not going to ask Angel. She'll lie for you. I think I'm going to call David Jones. He's your boss, right? I don't think he'd lie for you. What's his number? He's gone tonight, said Rachel. I'll have him call you tomorrow. What are you two doing? Trying to trick me or something? You think you can just come in here and try to trip me up? What are you accusing me of? I guess she thought the best offense was a good offense. I think you lied to yourself, I told her. 
You lied, Rachel. All three of us know you lied. Why did you do it? I could see the wheels turning in her head. Okay, I was here, she said. That's the reason I didn't want to tell you. I knew you'd give me the third degree and try to accuse me of something. Nobody accused you of anything, Toby said. I'm accusing you, though. You tried to make me believe Daddy was a liar. You tried to make him look like a liar to cover up your lies. What are you lying about, Mom? Are you having an affair with that asshole? You don't even know him, Rachel said. Why do you say he's a jerk? I've met him twice, Toby said. The way he looks at me makes me want to take a bath. But it doesn't matter. Are you having an affair with him? Rachel's eyes ran from one place to another for a moment. She looked like a trapped animal. I didn't mean for it to be like this, she finally said. I wasn't ready. Wasn't ready for what? asked Toby. I just fell in love with Jerry, she said. She looked at me. I'm sorry, Oliver, it just happened. We work very closely together, you know that. He just, I don't know. He's like the other half of my soul. We just connected, and there was nothing I could do about it. We're in love. I was going to tell you when we were ready. As soon as we can both get divorced, we'll get married. I'm so sorry. I didn't want you to find out this way. Toby, it's going to be okay. You can still see your dad whenever you want. Jerry has a very nice house on the lake. He has a daughter too, you know. He likes you and will be very happy. Are you crazy? Toby practically exploded. I'm not going to live with that asshole. He'll probably sneak into my bedroom at night to molest me. You're right. I'll see Dad whenever I want because I'll be living with him. I won't see you, though. How could you? She turned on her heel and went upstairs to her room. I heard the lock on her door click. Rachel turned and looked at me. She'll get over it, she said. Jerry's a really nice guy, Oliver. I think you'll like him. I'm sorry, but I need to be happy. Jerry makes me happy, and that's all there is to it. I just stared at her. What kind of person was that? It was like she'd been kidnapped or something. I wasn't going to argue or discuss anything with a dangerous lunatic. Whatever you say, Rachel, I said. When are you moving out? Moving in, she asked. No, I don't have anywhere to go. Jerry's married and there's nothing we can do until we tell his wife. We'll all have to get a divorce and see how the settlement goes before we know what to do. No, you're moving out, I told her. I'll give you three days. Her jaw dropped. What the hell are you talking about? You can't kick me out of my own house. If anything, you're the one who should move out. You're forgetting something, I said. This is my house. I owned it before I met you. It was paid for and I owned it before we were married. The house is not marital property, it's mine. My name is on the deed, yours is not. No, you are moving out of my house. Where? she asked. Are you just going to throw me out on the street? I don't care where, I said. Maybe you can get a room at the Cheating Hooker Motel. Maybe one of those ones that rent by the hour, you know. That's where you whores do your dirty deeds, right? Her eyes filled with tears. That really hurts, Oliver, she said. You don't have to call me names. I wasn't trying to fall in love with Jerry, it just happened. We just matched and I realized I had to be with him. I wasn't trying to hurt you. Ah, you just accidentally hit me, I said. It's like falling while running with a stick in your hand and poking your eye out. My mom always warned me about that. Now I understand how it happens. Well, it's all right then. It was an accident. You don't have to be so sarcastic, she said. Why can't you just accept the fact that we love each other, Oliver? I don't know, Rachel, I said. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that when I left this morning, you told me you loved me. And now you're telling me you love him. I guess I'm just a little confused. I love you, Oliver, she said. I'll always love you. I'm just in love with Jerry. Oh, well, that explains it then, I said. You've told me every day for the last 18 years that you were in love with me, Rachel. I thought that's why we got married. We were in love. I guess I was deluded. Oh no, we were in love, she tried to take my hand. I shook it off. You have three days, Rachel? If you're not out in three days, I'll have the sheriff remove you and throw your shit out in the driveway. 
Please, Oliver, she was scared now. It doesn't have to be like this. We can still be friends. Jerry wants to be your friend, too. We have Toby to think about. I told you I love you, and I don't want to lose you as a friend. We've been together too long for you to just give that up. I just stared at her for a minute. I felt all that sadness, all that loss, fade away and be replaced by a wave of red-hot anger. You must be crazy, Rachel, I said. Friends? With you? With that asshole? I'm guessing no. You need to tell that piece of shit that if he sees me, it's only for a short time before he runs away as fast as he can. As for you, you're the enemy, Rachel. I will burn your house down. You have three days, and then I never want to see your whore ass again. I'll talk to a lawyer in the morning, and you'll get your divorce as soon as possible. I turned and went into the bedroom, leaving her standing there making noises. That was it for me. She followed me around, continuing her bullshit about friends as I moved her things into the spare bedroom. She had more clothes in her closet than I could carry, so I just threw them on her, carried the armful to the spare bedroom, and hung them in the closet. She followed me out. She stood there for a while, yapping and watching me, but when she went to hang up her clothes, I took advantage of the situation to leave and lock the bedroom door. I heard her coming down the hall, but she tried the knob and left. Toby texted me a few minutes later. Are you okay, Dad? Yes, kitten, how about you? I wrote back. No, but I will, she said. Okay, love you, I sent. Text me if you need anything. Drive me to school in the morning? She asked. I don't want to ride in the car with her. CC. I crawled into bed and lay there for hours, trying to figure out what I should do. I must have dozed off around three, and then my phone alarm rang. I got up, took a shower, and called my boss. I told him I was getting a divorce and needed a few days off. He told me to take as much as I needed and explained everything properly, which he was sorry about. I went and brewed some coffee, had a cup or two, and made breakfast for Toby and me. She came down on time, looking as lovely as ever for me, and pounced on breakfast. After a while, Rachel came in and had a cup of coffee, too. She tried to talk to us, but we ignored her. It was time to take Toby to school, and Rachel asked if she was ready. Toby just looked at her, turned to me, and asked, are you ready, Daddy? I jingled my keys and she grabbed her backpack. Fine, you can act like two-year-olds if it makes you feel good, Rachel said. She walked away, grabbed her purse, threw us another look, and left. I dropped Toby off at school and she gave me a kiss on the way out. I sat and watched her walk into the school. I thought about my friend Dan. He had just gone through a divorce and I decided to call him and see what kind of lawyer he had used. He didn't recommend his own lawyer. He told me that I should use his wife's lawyer. He gave me a name and I looked up the number. When I called, a woman answered the phone and left me on the line after I told her what I needed. She agreed to meet with me in the afternoon and I took all the usual steps. We had an investment and there wasn't much I could do about it. I could make sure she didn't have large credit card bills, so I called and lowered the limits on our cards to $500. This, of course, couldn't help my style either, but I'll be damned if I'm going to finance her little scheme. My meeting with Elizabeth Baxter did not start well. She had made some assumptions, and I had to disabuse her of them before I could get to work. She assumed that I was leaving Rachel for a newer model. You need to think again, I told her. She was having an affair with a co-worker. He's married, and they're both planning to divorce and marry each other. I apologize, she said. I will not represent anyone who makes moves like you say. I can't look at myself in the mirror. I understand, I said. We have a daughter. I want to minimize the consequences. Do you think it's possible for me to get custody of her? It's possible, she said. In theory, it's just as likely that one parent gets custody as the other. In practice, fathers rarely get custody, especially of female children. How old is she, and will she want to stay with you? She said she did, and she's 15, I said. It will make a big difference in the court's decision, she said. In this state, children over 14 have the right to choose, and the wishes of younger children are always considered. If she was very young, you wouldn't have a chance. Having a primary residence and the fact that the 15-year-old wants to stay with you should be an important part of the custody agreement. It shouldn't be a problem. Just do your best, I said. I was driving home and wondering what I was going to do. I was going to do something, but it had to be legal. 
Going to jail would cost me Toby, and I wasn't going to risk it. What avenues were open? Burning down houses, you have to be careful to make sure you don't burn your own. It's going to take a lot of thought and planning. I suspected his wife was as clueless as I was, so the first step would be to put her on notice. I needed to make a list. I was, of course, going to put her family on notice. Rachel's mom and dad loved me, and they certainly loved Toby, so letting them know was the first priority, but I wasn't sure how to go about it. Making sure all our friends knew was also on the agenda, and I thought I could stir up such a storm on social media that they would be interested in life. That was the first item on my list. She had a Facebook account for our family. I played around with it a bit, used Messenger a bit, and figured out what was up. I searched the internet and found out that good old Jerry's wife had done the same thing. I screenshot a few pictures and posted on Rachel's page that we were getting divorced, that she had found her soulmate in Jerry by posting his picture. I changed my password and logged out. It felt good. I wondered how long it would be before her friends and family started blasting her phone and Facebook page. I hoped the asshole's wife would understand what this was about. I didn't know her and felt some guilt for the storm of shit that would come down on her. But if she was like me, she'd rather know than remain in ignorance. I called my mom. The conversation went about as badly as I had anticipated. But after initial disbelief, she simply said that she would tell dad and that if I needed anything, they would be there for me. I decided to let Rachel tell her parents herself. We were close, and I didn't want to be the cause of the estrangement. Besides, I had no idea what I was going to tell them. For some reason, the phrase, your daughter is a cheating whore, didn't seem like the perfect message. They'd probably shoot the messenger. It didn't take a minute for things to start to fall apart. Around two in the afternoon, Rachel's number popped up on my phone. I answered, and she was furious. You asshole. Her first salvo gave me great pleasure. You couldn't just leave it at that, could you? I know you blocked me from Facebook. Put that shit away. Jerry's wife doesn't know. All my friends are calling me and asking what happened. My parents know. I'm telling you, Oliver, clean this shit up. No, you're not my boss, I told her. What, are you five years old? Put that away, Oliver, I'm telling you. Why, I asked. You should be happy. Everyone can get used to you and your soulmate being just that. Are you ashamed that people know you're a cheating whore, Rachel? I don't, she stopped. She obviously realized the absurdity of what she was about to say. Oliver, please take it off. It wasn't supposed to be like this. You lost any ability to choose what he would be like once you cheated, I told her. Any right to attention, any claim you had to my respect or even courtesy is gone. I told you, you're the enemy now, Rachel. Deal with it. I ended the call. The phone buzzed again, but I ignored it. It was time to pick up Toby. I told her the result of my conversation with Elizabeth Baxter, and while she was pleased that she was likely to be with me, on the whole, she was not at all pleased. What is wrong with her, Papa? She asked. You know I love her, but she's always been a little strange. I never felt she was grown up. Not like you, anyway. It was always like you had two kids, her and me. Didn't you ever notice? Not like that, I said. Now that you mention it, she's always been impulsive, but she's always been like that. I never thought she'd do something like this. Well, we'll have to make the best of it, she said. Daddy, I don't ever want to be in the same house with that creep without you being there. I don't care what you have to do, just make sure it doesn't happen, okay? I'll do my best, I promised. We bought pizza on the way home, and I was just enjoying my second slice when my phone buzzed. It was Bob, Rachel's dad. I wasn't expecting it. I told Toby who it was, and she told me to put it on speaker. He got straight to the point. Oliver, I don't know what exactly is going on, but Rachel came here last night and asked if she could stay with us. Care to explain how that happened? Did you ask her? said I. She said you kicked her out. Well, yes, but did she tell you why? No, she said she was going to explain but wasn't ready. Are you sure you don't want to wait for her explanation? I asked. Can't you just tell me? He asked. She was having an affair with Jerry Garner, the guy where she works. He's planning to divorce his wife, she was planning to divorce me, and they're dating, I said. What? That's crazy, Oliver. How do you know that? I caught them together yesterday. 
I said. Besides, she told me. Are you sure you didn't miss here? He asked. Toby spoke up. Hey, Grandpa. I was listening. Dad put me on speakerphone. There's no miscommunication. I was there when she told him. I'm sorry, Grandpa. I love you. She sobbed and he heard it. When he spoke again, his voice cracked. Don't cry, my love. Please. Just be strong, okay? I love you too and so does Grandma. I'll try to talk some sense into your mom. Oliver, are you still here? Yeah, I'm sorry about that, Bob. Don't worry about Toby. You are her grandparents and nothing will change that anymore. I know you love Rachel and will do what you have to do. I respect you more than I have words to tell you. I hope you don't hate me when this is over. That's never going to happen, he said. I'll find out what's going on. Call me if you need anything. It went better than I feared. Stuff happens and you do the best you can. There is no need to detail what went on during the divorce process. Most people know plenty of people who have gone through it. It was long, painful, and never once got better. Rachel was obviously delusional. She imagined she would get custody of Toby. That didn't happen. Miss Baxter was as good as advertised. I got full custody based on Toby's desire to live with me. And after hearing from Toby in a private meeting, the judge ruled that Rachel was entitled to unlimited visitation, but not the kind where Toby was left alone with her and Jerry Garner. In any case, it had become unimportant. His wife divorced him, but it seems the whole soulmate thing was a bit exaggerated, at least on his part. Two weeks after I found out about their affair, he was ready for a new conquest. All those grandiose plans evaporated like fog on a sunny day. It took seven months for the divorce to become final. Rachel changed her mind. I was surprised when, at the second court hearing, she asked the judge to schedule counseling. Neither Miss Baxter nor I could say anything. It didn't seem to matter, and the judge ordered it. We were to have eight to ten sessions. We got some weird old hippies. At the first session, we were asked to state our goals. Rachel's goals were long and complicated. She seemed to think that I should realize that the pursuit of her happiness was the main purpose of the universe, and that I should understand that she wanted no evil, only happiness. Mine, on the other hand, was much simpler. What is your purpose in these classes, Mr. Berriman? he asked. My goal is to finish them off, I said. Our spiritual master frowned. Mr. Berriman, do you really not want to solve the problems that brought your marriage to this state? I'm sorry, Mr. Rodman, but it wasn't my problems that brought my marriage to this state, and I really have no interest in working on them. I'm quite happy with my problems and intend to die with them. Rachel was just as horrified as Mr. Guru and didn't hesitate to take the bold step. Oliver, how are you going to go back to the way things were if you won't at least discuss it? I don't want to, I said. Let me make this clear to both of you. I have no business getting back on track or working on problems. I'm here by court order. I'll do whatever I need to do to honor that order, and then we'll go back to court and get divorced. That's my plan. Do you know that if I go back to the judge and tell him you refuse to cooperate, you could be held in contempt of court? said Mr. Patguide. I don't know about that, I said. You mean if you go back to the judge and lie? These sessions are recorded. I'm sure my attorney would be happy to subpoena you and expose your perjury. I'm here. I'll do whatever you say. You asked me what my goals are. I told you what they are. You see, I'm cooperating. He blushed. I'm sure the judge expected you to try to work out the problems between you, he said. I'm not responsible for the judge's expectations, I told him. I'm only responsible for my own. He tried to make things difficult. He gave me homework assignments that involved spending considerable time with Rachel, and she worked diligently to wear me down. Oliver, what would it take to get you to give up the divorce and work things out? She asked. God's providence, I told her. She waited for me to explain it, but I said nothing. What do you mean by act of God? She finally asked. Well, if you have a way to turn back time and not entertain good old Jerry, it'll work, I said. Otherwise, I've never heard of anyone but God having that kind of power. Do you have any powers you haven't told me about, Rachel? Well other than the ability to attract other men with your feminine charms. We continued to do the dull exercise, repeating mindless mantras, and finally it was over. 
We returned to court, and the judge asked if we had made any progress. Your Honor, there is no likelihood that my client will remain married to his wife, Elizabeth Baxter said. We would like the divorce to be finalized as soon as possible. My client and his daughter have dragged this process out long enough. Apparently, the judge agreed, because ten days later the order arrived in the mail. Toby saw her mother quite often, since she loved her grandparents and spent a lot of time with them. Every once in a while, Rachel would plan something that Toby agreed to do with her, but it was never the same. She socialized with her friends, and one in particular was at the top of her list. It was a petite blonde named Sabrina. It seemed like she practically lived with us. She was as cute as a month-old kitten and as sweet as honey. I was happy we had her, and they began to involve me in their activities. One of their favorite activities was water skiing. We had a boat, and when summer vacation started, we would go to one of the nearby lakes on Saturdays. On Monday, they asked me if we could go to the lake for the weekend, take our RV, and stay until Sunday evening. Since my social calendar wasn't too busy, I decided that was a great plan. Toby and Sabrina spent all week planning, and on Thursday, we packed everything they wanted. On Friday afternoon, a new red Jeep Cherokee pulled into our driveway and Sabrina jumped out. A nearly identical woman jumped out of the driver's side and Toby rushed over to hug the stranger. She and Sabrina led the unknown and clearly nervous woman over to me. Daddy, Toby said, this is Julie. She's Sab's mom and I know you haven't met her yet. Julie held out her hand. Hello, Oliver. The girls have told me so much about you. Thank you so much for inviting me to come with you this weekend. To tell you the truth, I was a little jealous that they were spending so much time with you and not me. She smiled mischievously at me, and I immediately understood why her daughter was such a charming little minx. I looked at Toby, and she gave me a fierce look. My knees trembled, and I knew when to give in. The trembling intensified when I looked at Sabs, and she raised one eyebrow. This is going to be great, I said to Julie, regaining my composure. We always have a great time. She wasn't stupid. She shifted her gaze from me to the girls, then back to me. Oh my God, she said. You didn't know, did you? The girls. She didn't have time to say a word. She was buried under an avalanche of hugs, kisses, and pleas. Please, Mommy, don't worry about it. We're going to have so much fun, Sabrina said. It's okay, Julie. Daddy will love you as much as I do, and he's a great guy, Toby says. Look how he just went along to get along. She untangled herself and looked around at them. You two go sit on the porch and I'll talk to Oliver, she said. They showed some reluctance and she said, now. They took her seriously and scattered. I'm so sorry, Oliver. I had no idea, she said. I'm going to take Sabs and leave. She'll be grounded for a month. God, this is embarrassing. She looked so small and embarrassed that I stepped forward and put my arms around her. She tensed at first, but then relaxed. Yeah, it's embarrassing, I said. They're very naughty, but you and I both know there's nothing wrong with them. Let me guess, you're single? She looked up at me and laughed. God, she was cute. No, she isn't. Do you think that's the point? I'm pretty sure, I said. Here's the thing. You're packed, you've got the weekend, the lake will be great. I'm not a bad guy, which you know from hanging out with Toby, let's play along. It'll be fun. We can tweak them a little bit. What do you say? She stepped back, looked around at the waiting faces of the girls and said, Yes, let's go. I gave them a thumbs up and they jumped to their feet and rushed toward us. I heard Toby let out an enthusiastic yeth. I stopped them and took one under each arm. Girls, that wasn't very pretty, I said. Sabs looked up at me and growled in her best skeletal voice, I am not cute. It made us all sad and I couldn't go on any longer. They were too sweet and innocent. We know what you're trying to do, I told them. Stop it, I'm serious. You can't just take other people's lives for granted. Yeah, but I love Jules and I didn't know how to introduce you to her, Toby protested. Well, you could have just told me, I said. She looked a little sad. It's okay, kitten, just don't do it again, I said. She brightened immediately. Sabs tugged my hand. Let's go. I can't wait. It's going to be disgusting, Oliver, you'll see. Julie laughed. Sounds to me like it should be the height of awesomeness, Oliver. But she's right. We're killing daylight. 
We grabbed two bags from her Jeep and climbed in. We secured the boat, and after picking up propane, we hit the road. It was a half hour to the lake, and Julie sat up front with me. The girls put on some awful music through their Bluetooth connections, and we started getting acquainted. As it turned out, Julie had her own insurance company and was also a financial planner. I kept my eyes on her during the conversation. God, she was so cute. I wondered if Sabs would look like her when she was Julie's age. She looked a lot younger than me, but it turned out she was only three years younger. She was probably five feet tall, had light blonde hair down to her waist and a nice tan. She had huge brown eyes, high cheekbones, and a perfect heart-shaped face with a widow's peak on her broad forehead. She was wearing jeans and a button-up top, but she was slim and trim. I didn't want to peek at her, so I didn't get a good look at her until we got to the lake. We got a parking spot for the boat and then the van. They took me outside while they changed clothes. Meanwhile, I hooked up the water. They came out when they were done changing. I went inside, put on my swim trunks and t-shirt, and we were ready to go. We grabbed a cooler full of drinks and hit the road. We pulled out of the no-wake zone and I opened the boat launch. We ran a couple miles around the lake and they were ready to roll. The long t-shirts were removed and the girls appeared before us in their usual awkward beauty. Julie was something else. There was nothing awkward about her. I said she was slender, but she was petite. She had all the woman in her. She turned and caught my gaze. She smiled and winked at me. Everything about her was perfection in miniature. Done? She asked. Her smile spared me the discomfort. Her teeth were perfect, too. I laughed. For now. You know what you look like, Julie. I'm a man. She came over and sat down so she could talk to me and keep an eye on the girls. We spent three hours skiing and Julie turned out to be very good. She steered the boat while I skied and she was good at that too. I wasn't as good as her or the girls. Physics was just against me, but I held my own. We went back to the park and they started wrapping up. The van had a great stove, but the girls wanted to cook outside. We got the camp stove out and I built a fire in the grill in the lot. I grilled wieners while they cut and fried potatoes and onions and opened cans of pork and beans. We cooked and packed a few meals at home, but it was our first night, and camp always cooks good. We sat down at the picnic table provided by the hotel, and soon we were talking as if we had known each other all our lives. Julie became Jules, which is what the girls called her, and she liked it, and she called me Ollie. The girls mentioned several times that Jules was single, and I finally asked her why. God, you're gorgeous, funny, smart, you have your own business. Why haven't some man taken you in yet? For a moment, she was silent. Well, the main reason is Sabrina, she finally said. I was young and stupid, Ollie. I was in college and thought I had the love of my life. A week before I graduated from college, I found out I was pregnant. I wasn't too upset. We talked about getting married as soon as we graduated from college. I guess that plan didn't work since you're talking about it in the past tense, I said. No, it wasn't. Three days after I told Brad, I found out he had been cheating on me for a month. I dumped him and never looked back. When Sabez was born, I didn't have time for a social life for a while, and then I immersed myself in building my business. By the time I could catch my breath and even think about dating, I realized I had this precious gift from God in my life, and I couldn't do anything without considering her. I understand, I said. I feel the same way about Toby. As long as I have her, she comes first for me. I can't put into words how important she is to me. She is everything that has kept me sane for the past 18 months. She put her little palm on my hand. I know, she said. She tells Sabs and me everything. I'm so sorry, Ollie. Yeah, life can be a bitch sometimes. We both sort of sighed. We looked up and saw two pairs of approving and loving eyes looking at us. They were talking in whispers, sitting in camp chairs under the shade of the canopy. I love your daughter, I told her. It seems like she's almost mine, all the time she spends with us. She loves you too, she said. She told me the other day that you look like the father she never had. When I looked at her, those big brown eyes turned liquid, and a tear rolled down one small brown cheek. I brushed it off with the back of my finger. She's a wonderful girl, I said. I think her mom is a special woman for raising a girl like that. And she's very brave for doing it on her own. She smiled, flashing her eyes, stood up, kissed me on the cheek, and walked over to the girls. 
We had a great weekend, and as she was driving away from our house, I walked over and knocked on her window. Jules, would you consider going out with me next Friday? I asked. Sabs squealed with delight, and Jules smiled his ingratiating smile. What time? Six? I asked. We'll have dinner and then we'll do something, okay? Oh, and Toby can stay with Stabs while we're gone? Sounds wonderful, and of course. She kissed my cheek and they left. Toby was waiting for me in the entryway. So? She asked. Did you ask her out? Did you kiss her? I put my arms around her and slapped her butt. Yeah, that's me and none of your business. She squealed, and the same sound was made by Sabs. I knew it. She's perfect for you, Daddy. I love her so much and Sabs is like a sister to me. I shrugged. What happens happens, Toby. You can't make it happen. Stop playing matchmaker. She pressed her face against my chest. I know, Daddy, but you were never going to do anything but just love me if I didn't do anything. It's not like I didn't enjoy being the only woman in your life. I laughed. Well, you'll always have a place in my heart that no one else can touch. You're my baby, and that will never change. She purred and snuggled up to me for a minute, then left to take care of Toby's business. Our first date went well. I invited her over to play racquetball. She was new to the sport, but she had played tennis, and the mechanics of hitting were about the same. Once she got used to the rules and hitting off the walls, she did well. It didn't hurt that she was a natural-born athlete either. She was fast as lightning and could change direction much faster than I could. Her diminutiveness helped. After work was over, we chilled out at a table near the court, drinking and relaxing. She grabbed her phone. Let's take a picture of the kids, she said. We struck a pose with rackets and goggles and she took the picture. They responded immediately and we had a good memory. We both showered and I took her out to eat. There was some really good Italian food there and we made pigs of ourselves. We were finishing our wine, Jules was sitting next to me in the booth, and we just leaned back, talking quietly and relaxing. It seemed natural to put my arm around her, which I did. She pulled herself close to me and smiled. I thought again about how sweet she was and realized that she would always be sweet. That was something that wouldn't change with age. When we pulled up to her house, she leaned toward me and looked at me expectantly. I realized that she wanted me to kiss her, so I did. I wanted to kiss her, even more than she probably wanted to be kissed. It was long and delightful. Her lips were soft and sweet, and she tasted like wine and cherry chapstick. As we moved farther apart, I noticed that the drapes were moving. I think we have an audience, I noted. She giggled, becoming very much like her daughter, or maybe her daughter was like her. I'm not surprised. You know they're trying to hook us up, right? Is that okay with you? I asked. She blushed. No, I like everything I know about you, Ollie. Me too, I said. We'd better get in there before they rip the curtains down. We met every Friday for four months. We were getting closer and closer, and I wanted our relationship to grow. I didn't want to pressure her, but some of our dates were getting pretty hot towards the end. I also found that I enjoyed having her as a friend almost as much as I enjoyed having her as a girlfriend. We chatted constantly on the phone. She texted me funny things or just a few words several times a day, and I did the same. I'd seen something or heard something, but I knew it would make Jules laugh, and I needed to share it with her. We became very close and I knew everything about her life, as she knew about mine. We started having dinner together, all of us, every Tuesday, and just spending time together, playing games, and I was almost as much in love with Sabs as I was with her mother. They were very much alike, and if you knew one, you knew the other almost as well. There were subtle and significant differences, but they were both utterly adorable, and the differences only emphasized the similarities. Life was beautiful, and the only overshadowing was Rachel's constant presence. She was still a part of Toby's life and therefore mine. I wanted nothing to do with her, and the sight of her annoyed me. She never stopped trying to talk to me every time she came to pick up Toby, or I took her to her grandparents. She still lived with them. Along with Jerry, she had lost her job at the clinic and was now working at another private clinic on the other side of town. If she annoyed me too much, I would ask if she had heard from him. That quickly put a stop to her attempts. How long will it take you to forgive me? She asked on one such occasion. Forgive you? 
For what? I asked. As far as I know, you don't believe you've done anything wrong. Not once have I heard. Forgive me, Oliver. I was wrong. I'm sorry I tried to make Toby believe you were a liar. I'm sorry I tried to take her away from you, tried to rape you in the divorce. And worst of all, not once have I heard I'm sorry I cheated with that dirty little girl behind your back. I didn't hear her then either. She couldn't take responsibility for her actions. I didn't know what it meant to forgive her. I reconciled and calmed down. I hadn't forgotten, but I wasn't going to spend a minute being bitter about it. People have the right to do stupid things. They have the right to divorce you, dump you, end their friendship with you, and you just accept it and move on with your life. People do shitty things every day. At that moment, I wanted to punish both cheaters, but I quickly stopped doing so. Their punishment was that they were who they were. They had to live with themselves. I intended to live with myself, and that meant leaving the lies and cheating in the past and living my best life. Rachel was an unhappy woman, and I sincerely wished any misfortune in the world on dear old Jerry, but it would not come at my hand. May God or the universe punish them. I had no part in this game. She became even more miserable when she found out I was dating Jules. I had left Toby at his grandparents' house for the night, and she came out to the car and stopped me. I heard you're dating the mother of one of Toby's friends, she said. I just looked at her. Is it true? she asked. That's my business, I said. Like hell you do, she snarled. I'm your wife, I have a right to know. You have rights to shit, I told her. You're not my wife. You found your soulmate, and it wasn't me, remember? Then this thing called divorce happened. My business isn't your business anymore, and yours isn't mine. Back off, Rachel. Don't stick your nose in my business anymore. When I left, I was steaming. Damn it, that bitch just couldn't leave it alone. I told Toby what happened. She was just as pissed off as I was. I ended up taking her to her grandparents, and Rachel took her out of our house. From then on, Bob or Cindy, the grandparents, would come to our house and pick her up. It took away a major source of stress in my life. On the seven-month anniversary of our trip to the lake, I asked Jules out on a date. We went to a nice restaurant and a club. She didn't drink much, only a beer now and then or one glass. That night she had two. I raised an eyebrow when she ordered a second one. She laughed. Yeah, I'm wild and crazy today, aren't I? You're perfect, just like you always are, I said. Do you really think so, Ollie? She tilted her head to the side. Because I think you're pretty perfect, too. If I'm so perfect, why haven't you asked me to spend the night? I must have looked pretty stunned because she laughed. Didn't you even think of that? I found the strength to gather my thoughts. Uh, yes, Jules. I haven't thought about anything else since that first day on the boat when I saw you in a bikini. When we started dating, I realized you were something different, special, and I didn't want to pressure you or scare you off. You won't scare me off, she said. I told the girls not to wait. Really? What are we doing here? I asked. Oh my God, Jules, let's get out of this place. Do you want to spend the night with me? She blushed, taking my hand and letting me lift her to her feet. More than anything else in the world right now. She practically snuggled up to me as we got out of the car, and she held onto my arm the whole way home, resting her head on my shoulder. I let her out when we pulled into the garage, and she snuggled against my side all the way to the bedroom. We fell asleep in each other's arms and made love twice during the night, once on my initiative, once on hers. I woke up the next morning lying on my back with Angel half lying on top of me, her hair covering us and her cheek resting on my shoulder. I just watched her sleep, mindlessly playing with her hair until she opened her eyes. My place is here, Ollie. I know, I said. Would you like to wake up here every morning? She opened her eyes and looked at me. You mean, living together? No, honey. Well, yes, but I mean, will you marry me, Julie Barnes? She lifted her small left hand between our faces and wiggled her fingers. Ooh, she said. Something seems to be missing. Hold that thought, I said. I started to get out of bed. I'll hold that thought, she said, but I can't hold anything else. I have to pee so badly. I laughed. Go, I'll meet you back here later. She scurried away, and I went down to my office, remembering to use the facilities.
I got what I'd come for out of the safe, and when I came back, she was already lying in a little ball under the blanket. I climbed inside and took her left hand again. I looked into her eyes and saw only love there. Julie, will you marry me? I put the ring on her finger. It was too big and we would have to resize it, but for now it was just right. She took it in her hands and looked at it. It's beautiful, she said. It looks antique. Where did you get it? When did you buy it? Remember when I told you I was going to the auction, said I? That was about a month ago. Yes, I remember. They were auctioning off the estate, right? Yes. I didn't tell you that I saw this ring in a catalog and went with the intention of buying it and asking you to marry me. It was made in England around 1810 for the Duchess of Avon. It has a long history. Do you like it? I'm thrilled, she said. It's the most beautiful ring I've ever seen. Are you going to answer my question? I asked. What? Oh. Yes, Oliver. Yes, I'll marry you. Oh my God, yes. I laughed and squeezed my bride in a hug. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to the channel and watch the next video.